What up techies? You may have heard that NASA plans to return to the moon in 2024. But did you know about the problem with moon dust? It could seriously damage our equipment and jeopardize the mission. The Apollo 8 astronauts were lucky enough to witness something almost unbelievable during their 1968 mission. They noticed that sometimes there would be a haze on the horizon just before sunrise and sunset, dissipating within seconds of getting close enough so you could see all its details clearly, including bands shining brightly while other regions remain dark. This phenomenon occurred because our atmosphere scatters sunlight in different ways depending upon what's present. Without it, we wouldn't get two chances per day where daylight shines down through layers like this. In this video, we explore the issue of moon dust and how it could potentially prevent NASA from achieving its goal of returning to the moon. We also take a look at some possible solutions to this problem. We now have a very clear picture of just how damaging lunar dust can be, thanks to reports taken from the 17 Apollo missions and analysis of spacesuits machinery, and equipment after they have returned to Earth. It got into the lunar and command modules, irritating astronauts' eyes, noses, and lungs, as well as covering screens, damaging electronic equipment, and corroding mechanical switches. It also affected, and sometimes completely broke, watches, cameras, and other delicate equipment. Leaks in the suits became more common, leading to pressure losses. Hose locks and zippers became difficult to use. Mobility of the suit was reduced. Life support system displays were difficult to see, visors were scratched, and electronics overheated. As time passed, the spacesuits worsened despite repeated attempts to clean them in the lunar module using vacuums and brushes. The Apollo 17 crew spent the most time outside the lunar module, but they only completed 22 hours of surface EVAS before the spacesuits were damaged beyond repair. However, a future lunar mission would need significantly more time than 22 hours. 2015 saw the release of NASA's space technology roadmaps, which included a single, extremely lofty objective. Their goal was to have spacesuits that could withstand 100 EVAS, or 800 hours total on the lunar surface. This is almost 37 times as long as the Apollo 17 crew spent in theirs. This issue is more critical to the success of a permanent lunar outpost than any other currently facing NASA or other space agencies. But how can one even increase the spacesuit's lifespan by such a significant margin? Understanding the formation of lunar dust and the forces that cause it to adhere to surfaces is a prerequisite for finding an answer. The lunar surface is constantly bombarded by meteorites, some of which are only micrometers in diameter, unlike the Earth's surface, which is only occasionally hit by larger ones. A layer of fine dust covers the lunar surface because pieces of lunar rocks have broken off in the rain of debris. On rare occasions, the force of these micrometeorite impacts is great enough to melt the minerals in the soil, transforming them into the glass. The moon's dust is composed of both microscopic particles and shards of glass, and it is extremely dry because there is no moisture in the soil or air to bind the dust together, and because the wind does not wear down the particles or smooth out their sharp edges. Therefore, lunar dust presents a bit of a challenge. Not only is it abrasive and difficult to clean up, but it also has a significant amount of static electricity. Because of the constant barrage of X-rays and UV light that hits the side of the moon that faces the sun, the dust particles on that side of the moon are positively charged. Then, as they absorb electrons from the solar wind, they transform into negatively charged particles on the shadowed side. Clearly, this does not get along well with the complex mechanics of the lunar spacesuits. Winners included a fabric for spacesuits that mimics the way certain insects employ hair-like structures to collect, and deposit pollen, conductive fibers inspired by chinchilla hair, and an electrically charged brush that could be operated by UV radiation. These concepts take slightly different approaches to the same problem, but they all use charge to either passively or aggressively clean spacesuits of dust. It boils down to this, how do you prevent the outer layer of the spacesuit from attracting the charged dust? NASA had a brilliant plan of action. Instead of reinventing the suit's outer layer from the ground up, they developed a method that could seamlessly incorporate it into the many layers of fabric and material already in today's spacesuits. The team came up with the concept of a suit that generates its own electrical current to evacuate dust, serving as an energy shield. Additionally, the electrode's conductive substance was the first obstacle to overcome. NASA's use of electrodynamic dust shield devices on solar panels, cameras, and thermal radiators since the late 1960s served as an inspiration. But in nearly every instance, the electrodes were mounted to immovable, stationary structures. When an astronaut moves his or her arms or legs, the outer layer of the spacesuit is designed to roll over itself at the joints. Thus, although silver and copper electrodes used in contemporary edge systems may be great electrical conductors, 
Their poor elasticity means they would not withstand the fatigue induced by the continual flexing of the joints. Since considerable forces are applied to the conductor during extravehicular exercises, a new type of conductor was required. Ideally, this new type of conductor would have both high electrical conductivity and the flexibility to tolerate these stresses. Carbon nanotubes were the solution. These carbon atom tubes are only a nanometer in diameter and have one atom thick walls, much like a long, thin sheet of graphene rolled into a tube. The tensile strength of carbon nanotubes is far greater than that of copper, silver, or gold, and they also have a very high electrical conductivity. For example, a lunar spacesuit's electrodynamic dust shield would require about 101 grams of copper wire, but only about 16 grams of carbon nanotubes. Carbon nanotubes are a great option for future lunar missions because of their potential to provide high conductivity with low mass and to withstand the 800 hours of EVA that will be necessary. Next, we needed to figure out how to incorporate carbon nanotubes into the spacesuit's exterior. There are up to 21 layers of material in a lunar spacesuit, including a layer made from a combination of fibers like Gore-Tex and Kevlar. Electrodes made from carbon nanotube yarns were woven into this outer layer in a longitudinal direction to reduce the tensile force acting on the electrodes and to prevent electrical arcing. Even though this outer layer acts as a natural insulator, it might be damaged by extremely high voltages. The dust removal system was limited to around 1,000 volts because testing showed that it could withstand up to 12,000 volts without dielectric breakdown. How, then, does the dust collection system function? First, a parallel connection is made between the carbon nanotube electrodes. Next, a multi-phase alternating current is applied between 600 volts and 1,000 volts to the electrodes at very low currents. This causes electrical fields to oscillate and move across the spacesuit's exterior in waves. When they come into contact with the charged dust particles, they exert a repulsive force on the dust particles due to Coulomb repulsion. As a result, the particle is ejected from the orthofabric because the repulsive force is stronger than the combined effects of gravity and adhesiveness. However, this frees the suit from any charged particles that may have become lodged inside. The electrophoretic force describes the behavior of uncharged dust in the presence of a non-uniform electric field, as in this system. In sum, the suit's kicks convert the system's electrical energy into mechanical energy in the form of dust. NASA built a prototype knee joint that featured carbon nanotubes woven into an outer orthofabric layer, and then used it to determine how much of a lunar dust simulant was removed under varying conditions. And the results were astonishing. They found that the system could remove up to 96% of the lunar dust simulant by comparing high-resolution images of the fabric taken before and after the electrodes were activated. Huge potential exists for this to be utilized on future moon missions. During EVAs, the dust removal system could either be left on constantly to prevent dust from binding or turned on manually if an astronaut noticed a significant dust accumulation. Even though the technology to prevent dust from settling may seem inconsequential, the razor-sharp nature of lunar dust poses a danger to any future human settlements on the moon. We find engineering fascinating because of challenges like this one where a seemingly insignificant environmental effect calls for a revolutionary material, an easy fix that any recent engineering grad could have contributed to creating, and then used to send something to the moon. Seeing your creation go from the lab to the factory floor to the real world is one of the most rewarding creative experiences possible. This is an amazing development, and it's cool to see the different ways that NASA is using technology to help us explore space. I can't wait to see what they come up with next. Have you seen anything else from NASA that has blown your mind recently? Leave us a comment below and let me know.